So the reading is from Matthew chapter 24, and we'll just read the first three verses. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Ruth. It's a long passage this evening, and um, I thought it would be uh, natural to speak on it in three chunks, and so I've asked Ruth to read on it in three chunks as well. Um, So uh, this is the sixth of our um, series of talks on mountains in the Gospel of Matthew. And um, we've seen... uh, these mountains being used for different purposes. Jesus has used the mountains to get close to God um, uh, in his temptation and prayer and in the transfiguration that we heard about last week. And we've also seen him using mountains as uh, as a kind of an amphitheater um, so he could talk to huge crowds um, as in the Sermon on the Mount uh, and the feeding of the 5,000. Well now we're having uh, using a mountain Uh, as a comfortable place to sit and relax um, and talk through a difficult subject uh, with just a handful uh, of disciples. Uh, And it is a difficult subject and um, I think it would be good to just pray briefly again um, before I uh, take you through this. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, Jesus a great teaching and uh, thank you for being able to be here this evening. Lord I pray that you would speak to our hearts, uh, that you would guide my words and that you would help us to uh, learn uh, from you uh, this evening. Uh, I pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Um, So um, they needed to sit down and relax as it happens. uh, it's the, the, the time uh, of this passage is uh, mid-afternoon, the uh, uh, middle of a Tuesday afternoon, the Tuesday between Palm Sunday and Good Friday. And uh, Jesus and his disciples have been standing up all morning um, in the temple, actually uh, in heated discussions with the hypocritical religious leaders. And that phrase that Jeremy used at the beginning of the service about the blind leading the blind comes straight out of the previous chapter in Matthew's Gospel uh, where he was um, characterising what was going on in the temple. Um, uh, He'd been there on Monday too, clearing out the temple, clearing out the money changers and the trinket sellers um, who shouldn't have been uh, in the house of God which should have been a house of prayer. He'd been there on uh, Sunday. That had been an exhausting day too when he'd come into Jerusalem in his triumphal entry um, uh, with, the, with the crowds uh, waving palm branches all around. So it's been difficult. Uh, sorry, it's been exhausting and it's nice to sit down. And also they needed to talk about a difficult subject uh, and that subject was, in fact, uh, God's judgment. Uh, The subject arose because on the way out of the temple, Jesus had made this comment about this magnificent building was going to be completely destroyed with not not one stone left on another. And the disciples actually knew that this was connected with all of the goings on in in the previous days and in in fact in the whole previous uh, a, a time of Jesus' ministry in the last three years and, and, and before to do with the hypocrisy uh, of the leaders, uh, the religious authorities there um, and they were perplexed about that. Um, they wanted to know when it would happen 
Um, and they felt that uh, the end of the temple would be in some sense the end of the world. Um, this was the world they knew. It was centered around the worship of this temple. And so they made this connection between the end of the temple and the end of the world, the end of the age. And then that comes round to judgment again because um, you know, in his ministry Jesus had been saying that he would return and he would judge the world in final judgment. And so the disciples asked not only when will the temple be destroyed but what will be the signs of the end of everything. And, um, you know, that's a monster question. That, uh, it's arguably two or three questions in one, and it's a big question, uh, and it's a difficult subject. And even the answers that Jesus gives um, this evening, they focus on um, basically saying what's going to happen and how we should respond to that and live through it. And even answering those questions is a big task. There are some other questions that we might have on our minds um, and which I, uh, through sheer reasons of time, am not going to address um, in talking just now, but I'm very happy to talk about them afterwards if any of you would like to do that. One question is, what is this? Does God have a right to judge us? What are his grounds of judgment? Um, another question which very much rise, arises in the passage is why do innocent people uh, suffer in the troubles of this world? Um, those questions are important um, and, uh, and yet I can't, I, 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 they're, they're not the main focus of this passage so I'm going to speak to what is the main focus which is what's going to happen and how do we respond to that? Um, now, there were these two questions about the end of the temple and about the end of the world. But Jesus responded to those questions with a single answer. Um, if he'd only answered the question about the end of the temple, then, to be honest, uh, we could have read the whole passage. It would have been four verses long. He would have skipped straight to verse 34, and he would have said, this generation isn't going to pass away before it happens. He was speaking in the year 27 AD, the temple was destroyed in the year 70 AD, so only 43 years later, and a lot of the people who were alive at that time, when he spoke, would be alive again when this uh, catastrophe happened. Um, and sometimes it's obvious in his answer that he's referring to the end of the temple, but sometimes um, it's obvious that he's referring to the end of the whole world when he talks about God coming and gathering his people in verse 31. But sometimes it seems he's talking about both at once. And it's not always easy to know which. And so there is one answer. And the reason why there is that one answer is because the signs are very similar. And also because what we should do about it in response is very similar. And that will become very clear, I think, by the, um, uh, by the time we're done. So, um, yeah, so let's start by looking at his... Uh, direct uh, answer and that's in verses 4 to 35 I'm just going to uh, stage to Ruth again so Matthew 24 verses 4 to 35 Jesus answered watch out that no one deceives you for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. 
And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no, no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequalled from now, from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equalled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, there is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or, here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the man of, uh, Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is right, is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Thank you, Ruth. So the first answer that Jesus gives in, in those uh, verses for those looking out for signs is it actually going to be very confusing. There are going to be wars and, and rumours of wars and famines and earthquakes. And we might well add there are going to be plagues and pandemics. Um, there are going to be disasters that affect a lot of people. And um, these may look as though they're the signs um, of the end. They will, uh, insofar in as they affect people, people will want uh, comfort. They will want a kind of a saviour, but there will be uh, false uh, saviours, false messiahs, uh, scammers and uh, fakers. And... Um, so there will be this demand for comfort, but even that will be, be met um, by misleading signs. So the fakers aren't the real thing. And even the signs, Jesus says, aren't necessarily the real thing. He says they're the beginning of birth pains. They hurt, but they aren't, you know, it isn't time to call the midwife or hop into the taxi. We actually got caught out by this. Um, we were in... Um, in a hospital on the 29th of February 2000, thinking that uh, our daughter would arrive that day. But it turned out to be the beginning of birth pains and she didn't arrive until the 6th of March, which means she's now 20, which is convenient. Um, so, um, so, so you can get caught out, it's gonna be confusing. And the second thing is, um, uh, Jesus starts talking in chapter nine about persecution. He says there won't just be these ordinary wars about money and land and resources and power and such, but there will be a kind of a spiritual war. There'll be, a, there'll be battles about souls and about lifestyles. And um, on the one hand, you'll see the gospel going out into the whole world. But on the other hand, you will see this resistance and persecution and treachery. 
And you'll see that some people, some uh, Christians, will respond to that by standing firm. But others, their love will grow cold. And then um, in the next few verses, um, 15 to 21, uh, Jesus talks about this abomination that causes desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel. Well, those are very strange words um, and scary, and they're actually meant to be scary. This, uh, um, you know, if you, if you look back in Daniel uh, and you see um, him, uh, the, the, the part of Daniel where he uses this language, it referred to a time 200 years ago, as Jesus was speaking, where um, a ruler of um, the land that uh, is now Israel uh, persecuted the Jews terribly and uh, put in uh, idols into the heart of the temple, uh, abolished the, um, the various aspects of the Jewish religion and persecuted the people. And this was an abomination. It was a terrible thing and it caused... Uh, desolation throughout the nation uh, it was right there in the holiest of places and this really happened 200 years ago Jesus says you know th these things do happen again from time to time it's not just ordinary persecution it's not just ordinary war this is a terrible form of of um, uh, of, 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 of misuse of power and a, a terrible form of an attack on God that happens in the world from time to time. And the, um, the Roman wars against the Jews, which took place in, in 66 to 70 AD, and then again in about 135, they were very similar to this. They were directed very specifically against the Jewish religion. Um, you could say that the Holocaust was very similar to this. And there have been terrible wars, not just ordinary ones, throughout history the, um, that, that, that we could uh, think about. Perhaps most recently, the ravages of um, uh, IS in uh, Syria and Iraq. And these are directly against God, directly against the heart of all that's holy, all that's decent. Um, and what do you do in these times? Well. You, you, you've got to get out of there. You've got to flee. You've got to not even stop to collect your coat. And it's worse for some people than it is for others. If you're young and fit, maybe that's fine. If you're a young mum, it's terrible. <coughs> if it happens in summer, maybe it's not so bad. If it happens in winter, it's terrible. And, um, you know, just during this lockdown, we've got a little glimpse of that, haven't we? How when difficult things happen, they affect people differently. And at different times, they're they're worse than others. Um, and so Jesus says there will be times like this throughout history, but at the very end times, he says it will actually be worse than any of these times before, a time of distress unequaled from the beginning of the world. Well, you know, reading these three paragraphs, um, they definitely aren't the most joyful paragraphs in Scripture. Um, you know, they're about uh, an escalating series of different types of conflict. And so the question for us is, well, is there any comfort for us as we read this? Well, then let's go to verse 22, where there is um, comfort, um, where Jesus says that these times will actually be um, uh, shortened. God's purpose uh, in this world is to save people from sin, to save people from um, uh, the effects of suffering in this world. And um, every one of those people he saved, he sent Jesus because of that purpose. Uh, he sent him to uh, uh, die on a cross to save us from our sins. So he saved us at great price and he's not going to give up on us. And so he says he will cut that time of stress short um, uh, so that his people can get through it. Um, and then there's another comfort in the passage in that Jesus does actually say this will happen. It's uh, really rubbish, isn't it, if, uh, if the passage was all sort of sweetness and light and the world out there isn't. Um, so Jesus warns us. He's told, he says, look, I've told you in advance. I think also I'm just going to add 
um, something that, that's not in the passage but, but is worth remembering um, that we've got to be careful where we look for comfort. Um, we, often we look for comfort in terms of um, a, a nice life and you know if it was <laughs> I'm not really quite sure what it means but even a comfortable uh, death and um, you know Jesus is saying no there will be times when that's not there uh, when things are very uncomfortable but we should be looking uh, with an eternal perspective where the troubles of this life are actually quite short compared with that perspective um, and another thing is that these times of difficulty do remind us that the world is a serious place um, and um, you know not all times of difficulty in the world I would say are directly to do with God's judgment and not all people who suffer in them are the people who you know with the, with the biggest villains um, but these times do remind us that the world is a serious place and uh, we need to prepare for that well the passage began with us being uh, asked to watch um, and here again in verse 26 Jesus says there'll be more false signs there'll be people claiming to be Christ returning and they say look he's out there in the desert or actually you know he's he's, he's in a bunker somewhere uh, you can't see him but he's here but Jesus says that that's that ain't how it's going to be when he comes everybody will see him um, it'll be like lightning uh, the lightning can be over there but it's from one end of the sky to the other you look in the wrong direction and you can still see lightning it'll be like an eclipse everybody on earth can see it um, some people will be fascinated uh, like vultures gathering around a body or like people on the, um, one side of the motorway looking at an accident on the other there will be this morbid fascination about it but there will also be mourning and why will people mourn and I think the answer is because you know we are so used to thinking that there will be it's not because well we are so used to thinking that there will be another day that there'll be another chance and when this happens there won't be another day um, there won't be another chance all of those um, you know all of us who haven't sorted ourselves out with God by that time will no longer have the chance to do so uh, we can make peace with God on our deathbeds can't we some of us know people who've done that and we praise God that that's possible but that will be finished at this time and everybody will mourn uh, even those who are uh, safe in God's hands they will mourn that that opportunity is now gone um, and the other thing that will happen is yes God will gather his people um, he will uh, he will he will take them to final safety so this these times of stress will actually come uh, to an end um, so that's a real run through um, the times in which we live and in a way we um, you know we 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 we're 2,000 years late for the end of the temple and the end of the world hasn't come yet but we live and we, or we can live um, through uh, turbulent times and so this is a message for us that has a meaning for us and um, I'm just going to ask Ruth if she can read the rest of the passage now to the end of the chapter and we'll come and have a look at what that meaning is for us so we're now at Matthew 24 verses 36 but about that, at that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill, one will be taken and the other left. 
Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time, the time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly I tell you, he will put, in charge of, put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to, drink and, and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thank you again, Ruth. So, um, there's a very vivid picture, isn't there, here, of a of a of a, of a servant in a in a in a in a posh house, country house, and uh, the owner of that house goes away, um, leaves this servant in charge, and he's looking after the house uh, and the lands around it and the money, and the other servants too. In fact, um, he's kind of a senior servant. In fact, I'm gonna say he's a steward, right? So, um, in practice, this steward can do anything he likes uh, while his master is away. Um, but the thing is that his master is gonna come back. And um, when he comes back, he's gonna hold the steward to account um, about how he's been doing things. And so, um, by telling that story, in a way, Jesus is putting a question to us. He's saying, are we, um, do we acknowledge that this is actually our situation, that we are um, to live our lives like this faithful, like a faithful and wise servant or a faithful and wise steward? Do we even acknowledge um, that we are uh, God's servants, that we are not masters in our own right, but they were actually stewards of the things that we have. And if we do acknowledge um, that we're stewards, uh, are we faithful and wise? See, the problem with um, uh, uh, the people before the flood wasn't that they were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage. Um, you have to eat and drink. Um, or you'll die pretty soon. And um, we have to kind of marry and all that kind of thing and go to school uh, and run businesses and all these other things in life um, or our life will grind to a halt slowly but surely. Um, it's wonderful to have had your bands um, being read these last three weeks and um, it's wonderful to think that you know people are getting married and been given in marriage after all the hassle of earlier in the year and we know from that that, that these things really do um, uh, you know grind to a halt if we stop doing the big things in life so Jesus is not the problem that the people were doing these things um, the problem was that um, uh, that they weren't doing them uh, as stewards who has equipped us to eat and drink and marry and run businesses and stuff like that who's who's uh, given us this purpose, God has given it as, as purpose, who's made it possible for us to do it God has equipped us um, and so we need to acknowledge God in all that we do in this life, all the ordinary things that we do um, and um, uh, we need to use our time and our money um, and our bodies uh, properly and if we are responsible for people uh, like this steward was, and some of us are in our uh, families or workplaces, uh, then we need to treat them right. Um, and uh, Jesus says in here in verse 51 uh, that God will hold them to account eventually, and if they haven't 
carried out those responsibilities correctly, they'll be judged very severely, like the hypocrites. It's significant that uh, he mentioned the hypocrites there because that was the big problem with the temple uh, leadership. That's, uh, that, that's right, that the whole text of chapter 23 is about hypocrisy. So uh, let me ask uh, two questions then, or questions to two, um, uh, maybe to, to, to two groups of people, you could say. So the first question is to those of us who, perhaps in our heart of hearts, um, know that we aren't um, really living so much as servants of God, not as stewards of all that we have, but that we're living as our own masters. Um, well, if we're not living as God's servants, then we can't be faithful, can we? So we can't be a faithful and wise servant if we're not even a servant. And uh, we can have a kind of wisdom, um, but whatever kind it is, uh, it's not the wisdom needed to live a life that honours God. And so my, um, uh, you know, if we are in that position, then I would really, uh, I think it's important that we consider, you know, that we should acknowledge God as our master. Um, he's given us everything that we have. And, um, you know, we should think about it, what it takes to become his servant. All we need to do is, is come to him in Christ and he will, um, he will take us. He promises that um, uh, from cover to cover in the Bible. And, uh, and then we will, if we do that, we'll change our ways and we will change the way that we use our, our time and our money and our bodies maybe and the way that we treat people. Um, and, um, and God will forgive us all that is past and he'll help us to live for him. And we will find that he is actually a good master and his ways are good. Um, he put us to live on this earth and equipped us to do so and he's equipped us to live well here. And so if we are in that position, um, I think we should uh, think about, about that. But if we have already become, um, if we count ourselves as God's servants and we want to live as stewards, uh, rather than as masters of all that we have. Well, then the question I think for uh, those of us in that position is, are we living faithfully and wisely? Are we that wise and faithful servant? Are we doing uh, all we can to make sure that when those difficult times come, that we are the ones who stand firm to the end, and we aren't those uh, whose love will grow cold? Well, to do that, to be faithful in, uh, in, in all times, then I think we need to be wise. Uh, we need to be wise in good times um, to use them well. Um, we need to be wise to know that uh, hard times may come uh, and to prepare for them. We will need to be in hard, wise in hard times, I think, as well, to know that eternity is longer and ultimately more significant than those troubles um, and stresses uh, that you know, we've seen earlier in the passage. And we need to be wise on a daily basis. How can we do this? How can we stay close to God? Well, the answer is by staying close to God. We need to, be, we need to do that on a daily basis uh, and to, to pray and be in touch uh, with God uh, so that we can stay loyal and stay servant-hearted. So the passage began with a question from the disciples, and I hope I have helped to answer, uh, to explain Jesus' answer to that question. And it ends with this question from Jesus, who then is the faithful and wise servant? And my prayer is that that's me, and that it is each one of you. And I pray that God would keep each one of us um, through that final judgment and through the troubles um, uh, and the, the good times and the hard times in this world. Amen.